Good evening and welcome to Community Board 8 Speaks. My name is Jim Kleins and I'm first vice chair of Community Board 8, your host for tonight's show. Today's guest is Elizabeth Malone of the New York Mortgage Coalition. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Beth Malone is a uh, manager at the coalition. Her expertise is in housing, home ownership, financial education, emergency management, disaster planning, and property casualty insurance. She entered the nonprofit world in 2000 as the Insurance Services Program Manager for the Neighborhood Housing Services of New York, also known as NHS, and became head of Home Ownership Center in 2006. She is a committee chair of the New York City Voluntary Agencies Active in Disaster. She is running uh, the insurance education program sponsored by the Enterprise Partnership, and she's a graduate of Michigan State University. <laughs> Go Spartans. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. And what is the New York City Mortgage Coalition? The New York Mortgage Coalition is a collaboration between the major lenders in the in metro area and 11 not-for-profit uh, community-based housing counseling agencies. What are the keys to risk, especially in light of Hurricane Sandy? In a typical disaster, 80% of the money for recovery comes from the insurance industry. Now, no disaster is actually typical, and Sandy had some, brought to some issues that I hope we can get to, but I wanted to cover some of the basics about um, insurance because it is a form of risk management. And the key is really to understand how you choose to handle risk and what you're comfortable with. Um, people can make a very different set of decisions based not on whether insurance is good or bad or a policy is good or bad, but how they want to manage their own risk. Um, the basics of insurance are really not that difficult. The more money you, the more risk you transfer to an insurance company, the more you're going to pay in premium. And for every form of ownership, there is actually a, what they call a form of insurance, and that's the technical term, form. What form of insurance do you have? Insurance sounds like English, but it isn't. It's a language of its own, and that's why I'd, I really want to cover some of the basic terms um, so that we're clear on, on, on what the language of insurance means. The homeowner has a certain type of risk structure, and so that homeowner's policy has a certain structure. And here, I think that uh, Community Board 8 has a, a large number of people who are condo and co-op owners. I really hope they become clear on what their risk is and how they can use insurance to manage that risk. It's over 66% of your population in Community Board 8 are renters. That's typical for New York City. And many renters don't know that rental insurance is available or that they are at risk that the landlord is not going to cover their losses in the event of a catastrophic fire or even a burst pipe. And then, of course, there's a form of insurance for every form of risk, the commercial forms, um, rent forms for when you're doing major renovations, um, and it goes on and on. Insurance is a package of coverages that, like the puzzle shows on the slide, are interlocking and influence each other. Everybody who is doing property casualty insurance um, has some structure exposure. Exposure is a type of risk. You know, you're, oh, you're exposed to risk because you have structure that could be damaged. You have your possessions, of course. Uh, your liability exposure, um, you are responsible for what you do to other people, and your liability coverage will cover that. That's particularly important with co-op owners and I think with renters too. And then there's endorsements to policies which can really sort of tailor your policy to what you're comfortable with in terms of your choices. Um, I think that renters and condo and co-op owners have some special provisions that they should be aware of in their policies. Um, renters were like um, you know, they don't have structural coverage, they don't actually have a category called building on their policy, like a homeowner would, but um, we know people who live in their apartments for 
decades in New York City, especially if you've got a good one. Um, and uh, during that time, people will do additions and alterations. They'll put up bookshelves. They'll put um, mirror tiles on the wall. They'll redo the kitchen. And so uh, the renter's policy has a special provision for that. There's a standard amount. It's usually like $1,000. But if you have put considerable work into your apartment, you would want to talk to your agent about increasing that coverage to reflect the reality of your risk something different than your neighbor would have. So you and your neighbor would end up paying different premiums um, because you have a different amount of stuff that you want to take care of. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that renters don't know that is extremely useful, especially in disaster, is loss of use coverage, which means that if you cannot occupy your apartment due to one of the covered events, um, you will have money to live elsewhere until the apartment is habitable. That way you won't have to worry about paying hotel bills, the extra cost of eating out, um, even extra transportation charges. Uh, a friend of mine who lost the use of her apartment downtown in 9-11 had a commute in from Long Island, and the cost of that commute was covered by her loss of use clause. So renters have some provisions there that are very helpful to them. Um, in condos and co-ops, um, there's a great deal of, of misunderstanding about the master policy versus your private, um, your private policy. Um, in a condo and co-op, the master policy covers everything that's owned in common, but it stops right where your risk as a condo or co-op owner begins. A condo owner owns the walls, floors, and fixtures. Mm -hmm. They own the box of their apartment. The master policy won't cover that. So unless you have a private, personal, co-op condo policy in the event of something like a fire, they'll rebuild everything and when you open your door onto a blank space. So again, you need to estimate and sometimes with the help of an insurance agent you can figure this out. Uh, what would it cost to, re to replace your walls, floors and fixtures, the bathroom, the kitchen, the closets, all the things you don't really think about. The other thing that the condo and co-op policy has is what's called a loss assessment coverage. If the master policy doesn't have enough coverage to make to finish the repairs to the building, let's say a devastating fire, and it's going to cost you know several hundred thousand dollars to repair, there's not enough uh, insurance on the building. The management can actually bill the members of the condominium or the co-op for to make up for the rest of the money they need to repair that loss. It's called a loss assessment, and this type of policy, because it's specifically tailored to that type of ownership, has a loss, of, a loss assessment clause. And again, you can have a standard coverage of like $5,000. You can up that to 10. And of course, the more coverage you get, the more you're going to pay. Sure. OK? Sure. Um, insurance does come in a variety of depth of coverage, because people have different attitudes towards risk. You know, some people just absolutely love the cyclone, and some people like the merry-go-round, okay? People who want more, a little more peace of mind will buy it by buying more coverages. And so the structure of the policies can vary to reflect that kind of choice. We have um, the basic coverage, which is a fairly minimal policy. It has nine events that are covered. It has the big stuff like fire and burst pipes, um, there can be theft on it, depending on, on how you want to structure it policy, but there's basically nine standard coverages on a basic. Uh, the broad form has 16 standard coverages. And again, throughout the industry, whether you're talking, whatever company you're talking to, these are standard forms. So a basic policy at one company will be the same, uh, n same number of events as a basic policy at a different company. Okay, and then the broad form, which is more coverage, has 16 events, and they list them in your policy form. You get your pamphlet, which you're supposed to read through in detail, put you to sleep in the first paragraph when they start defining we, okay, and <laughs> us, and the insured. There's a paragraph defining the insured. Sure. Um, and it does matter, too, because you have to know who in your household is covered by this policy. But um, at any rate, the um, the, the events that are covered for a basic policy or a broad form policy will be listed in the policy. It's a policy of what they call of inclusion. Anything that's 
listed in the policy is included in the coverage. Now the other form of insurance, and we see a great deal of this in New York, is the all risk policy. But this is insurance, so of course the word all risk does not mean all risk. It means all the risks except the ones we have specifically excluded. Uh -huh. It's a policy of exclusion. And there again, there's standard exclusions. Uh, for example, earthquake is excluded. Volcanic eruption is not. So mm. we can rest easy. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, we don't laugh. Volcanoes may be next after what we've been through this year. You and your neighbor, if you're comparing policies and comparing especially premiums, you have to ask, well, what do you have? Do you have a basic or do you have a broad form? Or do you have an all risk? Now, of course, the answer won't probably be at the tip of your tongue because the marketing terms used to, to describe the policies are things like silver blanket, golden coverage, exclusive plus, or whatever marketing terms um, appeals to the insurance company. So you really have to ask your agent, is it a broad form, is it a basic, is it an all risk? and have the agent define the policy completely. One of the things that people do that can be very troublesome at the time of a loss is they will ask the agent if he can do better on the premium. The answer to that is almost always yes, because what we can do is we can reduce coverages in one way or another. You know, we can go from an all-risk policy to a broad form policy. So you have to be a true consumer in this. It's helpful to know what questions to ask, and your agent, his job, or the, the, your, her job, is to make clear to you exactly what you are purchasing. And if it is not clear to you, it's the agent who has the problem, not you, okay? If they can't make it understandable to someone who's got the gumption and intelligence to live in New York City for more than 90 days, okay, then the problem's with them, not with you. But yes, you do need to understand that when you ask for a lower premium, how are you getting to that lower premium? Are you giving up coverages? And are you comfortable with giving up those coverages? What you need to ensure is a very personal position to take, a very personal decision to make. Your policy limits, you have to decide how much is enough. Now, for a homeowner, especially in New York City, and there's not a lot of single family homes in uh, Community Board 8, but um, you should know that the amount of coverage that you get has to be related to what you need in terms of bricks and boards and mortar to rebuild the house. One of the common mistakes for homeowners in New York City is to link the limit of their structural coverage, the money that's available to rebuild the house, to either the market value of the house or the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And we have found problems with lenders um, who, you know, like other human beings, may not understand insurance completely and will believe that, well, I'm lending you $600,000 to buy this house. I've got $600,000 at risk, your insurance <coughs> should be $600,000. That's not true. And as a matter of fact, it's not legal either. Um, the um, regulations, and insurance is very highly regulated in the state of New York, and very well regulated too. Our, our insurance department has one of the best reputations in the nation. Um, the regulation states that no one can require you to carry more insurance than you need to rebuild the house with similar materials, similar construction. And if you think about it, that makes sense. That's the only sense that you, that's what you have insurance for. You know, once you start building the house and rebuilding the house, when you're finished, you're finished. You don't need any more money. And as a matter of fact, the insurance company won't give you any more money. Um, they will only pay for what it is necessary to reconstruct the house. So if you look at a neighborhood, um, I know Brooklyn very well because I live in Gravesend. Um, it says, let's say Fort Greene, where a house a few years ago would be, <coughs> uh, the market value a decade or so ago could be very low, $60,000. I've heard stories of, you know, oh, I got the three-story um, brownstone for 10. Because um, that was the market value then. Now the market values are over a million for those kinds of homes. In that decade and a half, a whole lot of stuff has changed, but I can guarantee you one ha thing hasn't changed. That house hasn't grown any bigger. It's still three stories, 60 feet, whatever it was. 
So what you have to look at is what is the materials and labor going to cost to rebuild the house? <clears throat> and that's what you insure it for. So if you have a little house out on City Island, for example, I had a, a client who we advised on, on one of those purchases. The house price was, was very high because it was City Island, you know, that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But the cost to reconstruct the house was estimated to be like only $175,000. So even though she was taking a $400,000 loan, her insurance coverage topped out legally and according to the regulations of New York State at $175,000 because that's all the money she needed to rebuild the house. And that's all the money that you're going to get from the insurance company. Because once you're done, you're done. Mm -hmm. They don't just write you the check. And that's another thing that victims uh, of Sandy are finding out about insurance is that the money coming out of the insurance company um, isn't just a lump sum. It is there, there's guidelines behind how much money can be released by their lender. It's a two-party check. And we'll talk a little more about that after we get through some more of these basics. Um, but again, how much insurance you need really depends on what you've got. Um, a renter, for example, um, like I said, if you're, if you're looking at um, where you've put in a great deal of rehab and, and put up shelves and stuff, you're going to need more of that additions and alterations. Also, I have no idea how much stuff you actually own, you know. Um, some people live very bare bones and some people cram the place full, right? <laughs> Uh, and you also have to watch things like your collections. Uh, do you have something special and unexpected, like a, a $2,000 bicycle, or 7,500 CDs, or a China collection? Those are special, I special items that sometimes require an additional insurance. And then again, for condo and co-op owners, um, the condo is fairly straightforward. You know what your walls and floors are. You know what kind of fixtures you have. You can do an estimate, and the insurance agent can usually help you do this estimate of how much coverage you need to rebuild that. But how much stuff do you have in there? Again, you can move that figure up and down as you, as you need to. Um, the co-op owner, it can get complicated. On a co-op, the floors and fixtures that were originally in the co-op, the value of that would be covered under the master co-op policy. But here's what happens, is the owner before you may have upgraded, or you may upgrade, and your co-op insurance is not going to cover those. So that's why you need the floors and the fixtures coverage on the co-op policy, because your stuff that you upgraded Again, remember, it's a cooperative, so why should I, as your neighbor, pay for the fact that you decided to flock your walls mm -hmm. or put up silk? I'm not going to co carry that risk. You're going to carry that risk. So you have to be conscious of where your risk starts. And, um, and then the another big choice is whether or not you want to have full replacement value or whether you're going to have, um, which is actual cash value. Um, again, for renters and for uh, condo and co-op owners, where, especially co-op owners, where the amount of the premium is very much driven by the amount of personal property you have. Okay, A homeowner's policy premium is driven by the size of the structure, but for a renter or a co-op owner, it's driven by your possessions. Um, do you want to be insured for the market value of your possessions or the actual cash value? And here's what the difference is. The market value is the market value at time of loss. Let's say you have a sofa. I have a sofa from Jennifer Convertible. Um, the market value is, I don't know, $2,000, not even, $800, let's say. I haven't shopped in a while because it's an old sofa, okay? But I know if I have to go out and replace it, it'll probably cost me about $800. However, as I said, it's an old sofa. The actual cash value of my years old sofa is probably about 50 bucks. So if I'm covered for market value of my possessions, in the event of a loss, I would get the market value of a similar sofa at the time of the loss, $800, go out and buy a new one. If I'm covered for actual cash value, I would get, well, it costs $800 to replace it, but yours is 
eight years old, so we're going to depreciate down to the actual cash value at time of loss, and here's your 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm shopping at the Salvation Army for a used sofa. Mm -hmm. And again, because I have kept more risk to myself in actual cash value coverage, my premium's going to be lower. Oh boy, aren't I lucky? Until I have to go out and replace everything I own, <laughs> and sure. I don't have enough money. But everybody has to deal with the deductible. And the deductible is what the risk you keep to yourself. Um, it is not like a medical deductible. A medical deductible is something like you pay, you, you spend $500 in medical expenses, and then you start filing your claims to be reimbursed. In property casualty insurance, the deductible is literally deducted from your settlement. So if I have a $500 deductible, I have a kit of fire in the kitchen, um, I've got several thousand dollars worth of damage, the, my deductible is $500, so if it's $10,000 worth of damage, they'll take $500 off that, and the money I'll get from the insurance company will be $9,500. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm going to be short 500 bucks if I want to replace exactly, but you know it'll be my decision. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't get that fancy china set again. Maybe I'll just you know go to IKEA and go downscale where I have the money to do it. Uh, that works okay for possessions. It's a little more chancy for homeowners who have to deal with like a roof uh, because if you need to have the work completed, okay. If you have a thousand dollar deductible on a roof. If it's a $10,000 repair, you have a $9,000 payout from the insurance company, your roofer is going to stop nailing. Mm -hmm. And you're still going to have $1,000 worth of work to do, which you're going to have to take out of pocket. So when you're looking at your deductible, you have to look at you know, what you really can carry in the event of a loss. Okay? But again, the higher your deductible, the less your premium is going to be. Right. So it's really a juggling act. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, one of the good things about um, property casualty insurance is that right up until the time of loss, you can change a lot of those decisions. So it's not carved in stone the first time you write the policy. You can think about it. Also, since you add stuff to your life, you do want to keep up with what you're doing. If you put you know, 10 grand into redoing your kitchen, you want to let your agent know that you now have more structure that needs coverage and that you need to up your limit on that policy. Otherwise, you'll have a, a big shortfall in the, in the event of a catastrophic loss. The windstorm deductible is something I do want to bring forward, too, as, a, as an issue. As bad as Sandy was, we have actually dodged a bullet because the winds dropped. And um, so a, a lot of people in Manhattan, uh, especially just inland from the coast, uh, didn't see severe damage from this event. A windstorm, again, causes a great deal of devastation. It would cause much more, much more damage up, up here in, Man up in this part of Manhattan than you saw with, with the flood because you're subject to wind in a way that, that um, the, the water couldn't reach many neighborhoods, but it, the wind will reach everybody. And that's why there is a windstorm deductible. Um, because the devastation from a very bad windstorm, whether it's a nor'easterner or a hurricane, would be so widespread, the insurance companies would actually run out of money if they had to pay out all the coverage with the standard deductibles. So in the event of a windstorm of a certain event, a category one is usually the, the marker, they can impose what's called a windstorm deductible. And it's a percentage of your structural coverage. For example, if you have a, a structure that's insured for $400,000 and your windstorm deductible is 5%, your deductible is now going to be $20,000. So you see that that's going to be a much bigger nut to carry than your standard $1,000, $2,500 deductible. So the fact that when Sandy came ashore at less than hurricane wind force, that did, the windstorm deductible was not triggered. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the governor of New Jersey and, <coughs> the, and our governor both uh, made that declaration. Uh, they do not get to decide whether or not the windstorm deductible applies. It is really weather people mm -hmm. who determine what the, winds, what the wind speed is 
as the hurricane hits land. Actually, it came in as a tropical storm? It came in as a tropical storm. And that was good for two things. One, the winds were not so devastating as they would have been if they were any higher. And two, the windstorm deductible does not apply. So for people who had damage from trees and to their roofs and to the siding of their house, a lot of stuff was blown around, um, they don't have to bear that huge deductible. They can use their standard deductible. Can we talk about how the floodplain and the maps have changed, specifically regarding Community Board 8, yeah. even more specifically around the asphalt green area and the Stanley Isaac home? The issue of flood insurance is really crucial um, at this point in time for New Yorkers to understand. When we look at the evacuation zones for the city of New York, we have the zone A, zone, zone B, zone C. But Zone A, if you look at the maps, you can see that there is an area in our neighborhood here that is Zone A. And where you would have flood insurance would be required by your lender if you had a, a mortgage on your building, where uh, you would be evacuated in the event of a Category 1 hurricane. Most people would have flood insurance. If you're in Zone B or C, you probably wouldn't have flood insurance because your, your lender wouldn't require it if you were owner. And because you feel, well, I'm in zone B, I'm going to be okay. Of course, Sandy didn't read the maps and was an unusual event uh, by combining with that nor'easterner, uh, the air pressure disappeared. And so there was no air pressure to hold the water down. One of the big reasons for the size of the surge, uh, there were several. There was the fact that it came ashore uh, near Atlantic City, so that quadrant is where the wind pushes the pushes the water into the New York Bight. The second is that it hit at high tide mm -hmm. at a f and the, at a full moon, mm -hmm. okay? But the third mm -hmm. event, which took people by surprise, was that because of the com combining of the two storms, the air pressure dropped to historic lows. And air pressure actually presses down on the water. Sure. So when that didn't happen, we got the uh, intrusion of water into areas that we did not expect to see it. And you'll see in the Sandy Intrusion map uh, how your neighborhood, especially around the area you're speaking of, got a lot of water from Sandy. So did parts of Roosevelt Island that normally on a Category 1 would not be flooded. This wasn't a Category 1, and yet we had flooding beyond where um, it was expected. One of the other reasons for that is that the flood maps that drive the flood zone and the flood insurance requirements were done in 1983. And they have been working for several years on the new flood maps. They were originally scheduled to be um, released this summer, but they moved that up, the advisory base uh, elevation maps, because they know people have to make decisions about rebuilding right now and those decisions need to be based on what the reality is coming up in terms of our floodplains. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Beth Malone mm -hmm. from the New York Mortgage Coalition, <laughs> and thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, this has been CB8 Speaks. If it's Thursday, it's CB8 Speaks. Thank you.